What's up YouTube, I'm Guy, and today on the channel we're going to be checking out a luxury dive watch. Now, in the world of luxury dive watches, at least in my mind, under a certain price point, there are three kind of reference standard watches to choose from. There's the Rolex Submariner, there is the Omega Seamaster, and there is the watch that we have here today, the Grand Seiko Spring Drive Diver. Today what we have is the SBGA029. This is a Grand Seiko spring drive based dive watch and it's the older model. I'll explain the differences between all of the models in the tabletop portion of this review, uh, but suffice to say the difference between this model and the newer model, the SBGA229, is pretty negligible, just a small cosmetic change. Nevertheless, that's what we have here today. Very pleased to bring it here to the channel for review. And before we dive over to the tabletop, let me extend a thanks to my friends over at Exquisite Timepieces for loaning me this watch in for review. Exquisite Timepieces is a brick and mortar authorized dealer of a number of brands, Grand Seiko amongst them, located here in Naples, Florida. They've been in business for over 20 years and they're an outstanding group of people to work with. Now this particular watch is in their new inventory, but because it's the older model, it is the very last one they have available. I wanted to make that clear in case anyone out there sees this video in the future and says, I wanna go buy that watch. If you give them a call, they may or may not have it in stock at the time. But I do encourage you to call them or visit their website, exquisitetimepieces.com, if you're interested in Grand Seiko watches in general or any of the other brands they carry, as well as any pre-owned watches. They have an excellent pre-owned watch inventory. They both buy and sell pre-owned watches, so if you have something to sell, or if you're looking for something special, hop on over to their website, give Evan a call if you'd like to talk to somebody down at the store, and yeah, reach out to them, let them know that you heard about them through Guy and the Just Bluefish channel. All right guys, here we have it, the Grand Seiko SBGA029. Now, let's clarify some things about the Grand Seiko Spring Drive line of dive watches. This is again the 029. This is the pre-2017 model. I believe it was 2017. They came out with a new series of watches that are exactly the same with one small exception. The logo place placement, the placement of the logo on the dial, and the price changed a little bit as well. Now, on the 029 model, or the 031 model, you'll see that the Seiko logo at the 12 o'clock position is the simple, standard, classic, old-style Seiko logo, with Grand Seiko emblazoned at the 6 o'clock side of the dial. That's been changed for the new model. Other than that, and the price, they are the same watch. There's also two different types of watches. This is the stainless steel model, the 029. The new model, the 229, would also be the more uh, recently updated stainless steel model. There is the 031 or the 231, and it's the same watch but in titanium, a titanium case and titanium bracelet. Again, what we're looking at here is the stainless steel version and it's the older dial configuration or decoration. Other than that, effectively identical to the most recent and current production model of the Grand Seiko Spring Drive Dive Watch. Will we be doing a comparison of the Grand Seiko Spring Drive Dive Watch to the venerable and uh, you know one of my all-time favorite watches, the Rolex Submariner? Of course we will. A little bit of a spoiler alert, I love both of these watches, and I know a lot of you guys are probably going to say, oh, all he's going to say is good things about the Rolex and bad things about the Grand Seiko. Not so. I think these are both fantastic watches, and while everybody knows that I love this Rolex, I really do like the Grand Seiko quite a bit. Towards the end of the video, we'll bring this Rolex back into frame, and we'll do a little bit of comparison between the two watches. But for now, let's just talk about the Grand Seiko. Before we get into the basic specs, let's talk price on this watch. The old version, this version, the 029 SBGA 029 has an MSRP of $5,700. Now a lot of people are uh, gravitating towards these older dial designs. They like the dial design on this better than the new one. Of course there's a lot of people that like the newer dial design better. 
Uh, I'm kind of in the six of one, half a dozen of the other camp. I like them both just fine. I could happily live with either. But at $5,700, you could save a little bit of money on this watch. The new version, the reference number SBGA229, is $6,000. You're playing a $300 premium to get a new dial. Basically, everything else is the same. So they did a little bit of a price increase when they redesigned the dial of these watches. So if you want to save a few bucks, and if you do like this dial, I would um, hurry up and hunt one of these watches down, because they've been out of production now for a couple of years, and they're getting harder and harder to find. Now, I did mention that there's also a titanium version of this watch. Titanium case, titanium bracelet. That's the SBGA. 231 or the 031 for the older version. Uh, that watch comes in at just over $7,000, $7,100. So you save a considerable amount of money if you go with the stainless steel option. I like the titanium. I have seen it. I don't have one here today to review, unfortunately. Uh, but I don't think I like it enough to spend an extra $1,000. I do like the stainless steel version just fine. If you want to go with the more lightweight titanium version, I wouldn't call you crazy. You know, personal taste and preferences. Uh, but for me, I think I would just save the money and go with the stainless steel. Let's talk specifications on this watch. First, the dimensions. A case diameter of 44 roughly 44 millimeters, maybe a hair over 44 millimeters, as a matter of fact. A lug width where the bracelet attaches to the case of 22 millimeters. An overall thickness of 14 millimeters and a wingspan, a lug to lug length from one tip of the case to the other, 50.5 millimeters. That's kind of the only real downside dimension for me. 50.5 millimeters lug to lug or wingspan is pretty long. However, because of the overall shape of the case, the geometry of the case, this doesn't present nearly as big as that 44 millimeter diameter might suggest, or that 50.5 millimeter wingspan might suggest. This watch wears or presents very nicely on the wrist, even on my six and three quarter inch wrist, and that's why I actually do like this watch quite a bit. There's, of course, a number of other reasons. The price, it's a pretty good value. I am a big fan of the spring drive movement. Aesthetics are outstanding. Overall, yeah, it's fantastic. I'll get into all that in a minute, though. Let's continue on with the specifications and features for this watch. We have a 316L stainless steel case and bracelet. We have a sapphire crystal that is... Uh, Applied, I guess is the word that I'm looking for, with an AR coating on the inner or underside. That's important to note because a lot of people dislike having an AR coating on the outside of the crystal. It can get uh, scratched or scuffed up. It can show marks and wear. So you get great AR uh, properties, anti-reflective properties, without the problem of your coating potentially getting scratched or scuffed up. Now, we do have water resistance. This is a true dive watch by all definitions. 200 meters of water resistance and, of course, a screw-down crown. The screw-down crown, and we'll look at it more closely in a moment, is handsomely signed and very nicely done with the Grand Seiko logo. We do, of course, have an elapsed time bezel, as you would expect for a dive watch. It is a 120-click unidirectional elapsed time bezel. Luma Bright luminescence on the dial handset and on the luminous pip at the zero marker on the elapsed time bezel. The clasp, and we'll look at this in uh, much greater detail, is of course signed Grand Seiko. It's a dual trigger deployant clasp with safety latch, and it has what they call the slide adjuster, a system that's kind of similar to Rolex's glide lock. It's pretty nice, but Rolex's glide lock is a little bit better. We'll compare those once we get towards the end of the video. Now, one of the super awesome, one of the great features about this watch and several other Grand Seiko watches is the 9R65 spring drive movement. I'm a big fan of quartz watches, so by extension, obviously, I'm a big fan of spring drive. It's sort of a quartz slash mechanical hybrid movement, very accurate, 
It's just frankly outstanding. One of the hallmark features of the spring drive movement is that absolutely perfect, smooth sweep of the seconds hand. As you can see, there is no ticking, no stuttering, no jittering. This is not running at 28,000 vibrations per hour, or even like a high beat running at 36,000 vibrations per hour. This is a different kind of mechanism, and it just runs perfectly smoothly. A quartz oscillator inside the movement regulates a governing wheel, which makes sure that that uh, seconds hand continues to run at a perfect rate. Speaking of perfect rates, this watch is extremely accurate, plus or minus one seconds per day, or 15 seconds per month on average. That's going to be much better than pretty much all of even the best mechanical watches. One of the reasons, again, why I love the spring drive movement that come in these Grand Seiko watches. Other basic information about it, of course, 72 hours of power reserve, so if you take it off the wrist, it'll keep running for about three days, and you know how much power is available because there is a power reserve indicator down at the between 7 and 8 o'clock of the dial. Now, a lot of people dislike power reserve indicators. They think that it clutters up the overall design and aesthetic of the dial. I generally disagree. I like them. I think the added functionality of the power reserve indicator is um, worth the potential design or aesthetic issues that I might have with it. But frankly, I don't think it looks bad anyway. So there's that. First thing to hit on here is the Zeratsu polished stainless steel case, and of course the bracelet. High polished on the flanks, very nice beveled edges, everything is very clean, excuse me, clean, crisp, extremely well done. There is uh, some alternating brushed surfaces, and of course the brushing is very nice as well. Zeratsu polishing, people make a big deal out of it, saying things like uh, it is superior to the polishing that you'll find on other brands. It is a hand polish um, process, I guess is the word that I'm looking for there. Uh, it does take a lot of skill for the craftsmen that do the polishing of the cases uh, to, to perfect it. I believe, you know, they train for years and years at Grand Seiko before they're even allowed to do that polishing. In my experience, I don't really think that it's particularly better than a high polished, uh, you know, by machine watch. I, I can't really tell much of a difference on the Grand Seiko Snowflake that I reviewed in the past. I could kind of see a, a wavy, almost orange peel looking uh, distortion in the high polished areas, which doesn't necessarily bother me, but I think that that is less than ideal in most people's opinions. So yeah, the, the Zeratsu polishing... It's a little bit of a marketing ploy to kind of play up the fact that, yeah, it's very nicely polished, but not really better or worse than anything else, uh, you know, similar at this price point. The finishing aside, the overall geometry of this case is very nice. And of course, as you can probably see there, we do have perforations or holes in the case. So if you want to throw it on a strap, taking it off the bracelet is relatively easy. The geometry of Grand Seiko watches cases in general is always uh, an aesthetically pleasing shape to me, even going down to the more affordable Grand Seiko watches, be it the SKX 007, which is a watch that I own and love, the now unfortunately discontinued JDM models in the SARB line. They, they do uh, the overall design and shape of their cases extremely well. It's one of the things that really draws me to this brand. And while I do have a lot of complaints when it comes to Seiko, especially in their affordable range of watches, I can generally and most certainly appreciate the overall design style and aesthetic of their watches. They do a lot of things really well. This one is absolutely no exception. Now we're taking a little bit of a closer look at the signed crown at 3 o'clock position. It is, of course, protected by crown guards coming off the side of the case, but they're not uh, obtrusive or oversized. Everything has a very um, feng shui, just right size, scale, and pr proportions on this watch. And uh, the, the, the inscription of the Grand Seiko logo, extremely nicely done. You can feel it as you run your finger over it. Deeply etched or engraved, but uh, very crisp and clean. It's great. 
The knurling on the crown, as far as operating or manipulating the crown, also really well done. Probably not quite as aggressive as the knurling on the uh, Rolex Submariner, but very well done nonetheless. Now I'm going to zoom in here just a little bit closer to show you a couple things about the crown. First things first, when you when when the crown is unscrewed, and I don't know if you'll be able to see it on camera, there's a little red gasket inside the uh, on on the crown stem there, or the tube, I guess technically. Uh, that it's red, I think, is probably to be an indicator, so that, that you can look down and note that uh, you know, hey, the the crown is pulled out and you don't ex uh, accidentally forget to screw it back in. Perhaps from this side on camera, you can see it a little bit better there, the little red indicator. I assume that's what that's for, just to be a visual cue that your crown is unscrewed so you don't accidentally take it in the water. Now, hand winding the movement, as you can see, the power reserve indicator is almost all the way full, but as we hand wind it, if you keep an eye on that little hand, you can see that it goes up and up and continues to rise showing us that now at this point we are at a complete 72 hours of power reserve. Of course, you can't overwind these watches. It just uh, continues to spin, but you're not going to get any more power reserve if you continue to wind it, so there's no point. Pulling the crown out to the first position lets you quick set the date. Pulling it out to the next position hacks the movement and allows you to set the time. Pretty typical for most watches. The bezel on this watch... It's so-so. I mean, you know, much better than an affordable or entry-level watch, but when we start comparing it to other high-end or luxury watches, be it the new Omega Seamaster, which unfortunately I don't have here to use as a basis of comparison, or the Rolex Mariner, which of course I do have, I don't think that the bezel action is nearly as as crisp, as clean, as, as refined. It's good, though. Just just as I would always describe Seiko bezels, whether it's the ultra-affordable all the way up to even this expensive nearly $6,000 model, it just feels kind of spongy. That's the way I like to describe Grand Seiko bezel action. Spongy or mushy. Um, as far as back play, what do we have? A lot of people always ask about that. Not really bad. Click it over there. A little bit of back play. Click it over there. A little bit of back play. Most watches have a little bit of back play. It's not like a bank vault where it clicks into position and it's locked down. The alignment on this one, let's see if we align it, clicks it over at 12. Not a perfect alignment to me. If I click it over one more, you can see that uh, it is off just by a hair. That's a little mm, disappointing when we're talking about a frankly very expensive watch. Now you can kind of rested in halfway between to get it to line up and it stays put but it's not right on the detent it's like right there is right on the detent it's just back towards the um one minute side slightly so you know grand seiko they're <laughs> well seiko in general i should say sort of known for quality control issues, misalignments with bezels and chapter rings and everything. Like even here in this Grand Seiko, there is a very slight misalignment on the bezel. A little bit of a disappointment, but truth be told, even my Submariner's bezel is slightly misaligned as well. I think it's just par for the course, especially when we have ceramic bezel inserts like we have here, like we have on the Rolex. I think they are more difficult to assemble and... Um, they're they're not put on easily so so that the watchmakers can align them. I think that's probably the reason why we see so many misalignments on watches like these. Uh, the, the, that's really not that important though. Like I said, it does line up if you kind of just give it a little nudge there. So not a big deal. Uh, what else about the bezel? Uh, the bezel assembly, in particular the uh, knurling or, or, or texture of the edge. Very nice. Not quite as aggressive as we see on the Submariner, uh, if you're familiar with that watch, but very good edge uh, texture or, or knurling. Compared to, say, an Omega Seamaster, I think you get a much better purchase, making the bezel operation much easier. So better than some, not uh, necessarily better than all of the higher-end luxury competitive options on the market. It is pretty good, though. I do like it. We, of course, do have Lumi Bright Loom at the zero marker on the Luminous Pearl. All of the uh, uh, graduations on the bezel, deeply engraved into that ceramic, 
filled. I don't know what the fill is. It's probably just some sort of enameled paint, not 100% sure, but the entire bezel isn't loomed. Just the luminous pearl is what I'm getting at. Now the dial and the handset also loomed with Luma Bright, and um, Seiko Luma Bright is of course legendary. It's very bright, it's very long lasting. As you would expect, it works outstanding. Even the counterbalance lollipop pip on the seconds hand is loomed, and that is as bright as all of the markers on the dial or the handset. The dial features uh, applied markers, sort of a triangle applique at 12 o'clock, um, circles at all of the hours, with the exception of batons at the 6 and 9. Of course, we have the date over at the 3 o'clock position with a white frame around it, so no marker there. The Seiko logo at 12 o'clock is applied as well. If I kind of get in at an angle, perhaps you can see it standing up off the dial. Very nicely done. But the Grand Seiko branding down at the bottom is, of course, just printed. The power reserve indicator over at the 7 to 8 o'clock position. Again, I like that it's there. Yeah, it's asymmetrical, but I don't have a problem with that. I like the functionality of it, so no issues for me there. The broad arrow minute hand is kind of a Seiko staple. I mean, you see handsets like this on a lot of their more affordable watches, and I like that this carries through even up to the Grand Seiko line. It kind of ties the brand together. It gives it some uh, continuity, I guess is how I would call it. You know it's a Seiko when you look at these hands, and I'm sure there's probably other brands that use similar style of hands, but when I see this big broad arrow minute hand, when I see that hour hand, when I see the seconds hand with the luminous lollipop pip out on the counterbalance side, I think Seiko. And, you know, it just kind of makes me happy, I guess. Overall, yeah, the dial, very well done. We, of course, have the chapter ring out there with the seconds and or minutes track. That is aligned very nicely, no problems with that. The presentation is very simple, it's pretty basic, it's kind of typical. It looks like a lot of other watches, it looks like the Submariner kind of, it looks like a Omega Seamaster kind of. They all kind of look like each other, I don't think anyone is necessarily stealing ideas from the other. Um, it just looks like a dive watch, and for that I, I like it. It looks how I would expect it should. The design is outstanding just like all of those other watches. The bracelet on this watch, pretty nicely done. I do have some complaints about it though. Uh, first, let's talk about the end links. The end links are outstanding, very nice solid fit. No complaints there. The three piece kind of oyster style bracelet with the polished um, edges on the center links, it looks good. It's a little more dressed up than some people might like. Kind of, um, kind of reminds me of the, um, Speedmaster bracelet a little bit. It's got that blinginess to it. It's not as utilitarian as this Rolex Oyster bracelet. Again, some people are going to like that. Some people are going to dislike it. I kind of like it. I like that it's a nice change of pace. My complaint with the bracelet, though, if we look at the uh, edges here on the links, they are, and you can see on the inside, I'm trying to get some good light in there, with the little arrows, as you can tell, uh, a pin and collar system. The links are not held together with a screw system. That's kind of a letdown for me. In some regards, I understand why they might do that. The pin and collar system might be a little more secure. The screw systems can have the propensity to, for the screw to back out just through use and vibration and the and you know the articulation of the bracelet. I get that, but I've never seen it personally happen. If you use a little dab of Loctite or thread locker, you're fine. And it's so much easier to change and resize the screw system. This pin and collar system, I can I can deal with it. I can manage it. But it's certainly not ideal. I wouldn't choose it <laughs> given the option. So that's a little bit of a letdown. Especially at a watch at this price point. I think they could spring for the screw system. The clasp, also. Fairly nice, but not my favorite. First of all, fold-over safety latch is signed Grand Seiko. Okay. It's kind of tight. It doesn't feel really nicely refined. It's okay. It's usable. It just doesn't feel luxury. Like, it doesn't match the price of this watch. The dual-trigger deployant on the clasp... Again, it just feels like uh, 
Uh, it's not matching the price, the expectations. We do have micro adjust, but it's the standard style um, pin micro adjust, spring bar style micro adjust. That's kind of strange that they have that and they have this adjustment system where you open this hinge and then you can slide out in increments up to about an inch. Uh, you can open up the, the clasp. So you can dial it in with the micro adjust here in the clasp and then you can also do your daily kind of, I want to let it out a little, I want to bring it in a little adjustments with this thing. The problem is it's just kind of an ugly system. Like let's say you wanted to let it out while it's on your wrist. That doesn't look very high end or attractive. Also the metal of this piece of it, of this uh, slide adjust adjuster as they call it, does not feel like really, really high quality metal. It feels like kind of low quality stamped metal. A little bit of a letdown. Now, that's just in terms of quality. In terms of functionality, it absolutely works. When it's on your wrist, if you need to let it out a notch or two, you can let it out a notch or two. And as a matter of fact, you can do it while it's on the wrist. So you don't even have to risk the watch falling off. You just open it up and just let it out while it's on your wrist a hair. That functionality is good. It's just the overall quality kind of lets me down a little bit. It's certainly usable. It's certainly better than nothing. It's better than what a lot of more affordable watches are offering, but when we compare it to the Rolex Glide Lock or the new Omega Seamasters adjustable clasp system, the name of that escapes me. I don't know if they actually have a technical name for it or not. It's not as good. It's, I mean, functionally, it's the same. They all work more or less the same. It's just not as nicely built. It's not as refined. It's not as high quality. So, you know, six of one, half a dozen of the other maybe is uh, one way to look at it. But when it's on the wrist, I think that's probably the biggest complaint. And you have this little gap here. That just doesn't look aesthetically very pleasing. And, uh, yeah, I'm not... I'm, I'm glad it has... Some, I want to say I'm not a fan, but, like, I'm glad it has something. I'm just disappointed that it's not as good as I know they could make it. They could do better and should do better. Now let's talk comparisons. And unfortunately, I don't have a Seamaster. I'd love to compare this to the Seamaster as well, because when we're talking about high-end luxury dive watches, under $10,000 anyway, because we could talk about the Blanc Pound 50 Fathoms as well. I, I mean, mainly what you're talking about is the Submariner, the Grand Seiko, and the Omega Seamaster. Unfortunately, again, I don't have the Seamaster here, so we're just going to look at these two. In terms of the overall size, something that I like about the Grand Seiko is that it doesn't feel a whole lot bigger than my Submariner. My Submariner is, of course, got a 40 millimeter case diameter, lug to lug 48 millimeters. On paper, this is 44 millimeters with a lug to lug of 50 and a half. On paper, that's quite a bit larger. But on the wrist and in person, the visual presentation between these two watches is not significantly different. Both of these are perfectly wearable, even on my relatively slender six and three quarter inch wrist. As a matter of fact, let's throw the Grand Seiko on the wrist so I give you guys an idea of how, how it looks. So there it is, again, six and three quarter inches of uh, uh, my wrist uh, circumference. And yeah, it works. It's not too bad. The Generally, the, this lug-to-lug -lug distance of 50.5 would be way too big for me. But I think because of the contours of the case shape, which is kind of going to be difficult to find a good angle, uh, you know, it, it, it works. It honestly works. I could probably do this size watch in this style and configuration without too much of, a, of an issue. Now, I can take bigger watches when they're dive watches and when they're chronographs, I like for, uh, you know, a more casual, just time-only watch, something a little bit smaller, generally 36 to 38 millimeters. And I used to always say that for dive watches, I like 40 to 42, preferably. But even at this 44 millimeters, this is a very wearable watch. The, the size and scale works because I think of the design aesthetic. I, I can't really express why, but for some reason, even though this is much bigger than I would generally prefer, it works really well. Now, of course, the Grand Seiko, much more affordable, $5,700 MSRP for this specific model, the older dial variation, the current generation, $6,000, versus the Submariner, $8,550. 
six thousand to eighty-five, call it twenty-five hundred ish dollar difference. That's a big difference. I think that that makes this Grand Seiko a huge value prop. Now, technology-wise, they're significantly different. The Grand uh, the Grand Seiko, the point into the Rolex for some reason. The Grand Seiko is, of course, spring drive, which is a quartz regulated movement that runs on a uh, mechanical winding mechanism. It's kind of a very simple way to describe it. That technology is very, very much different than your standard Swiss lever escapement style like the Rolex here. Some people are going to say, I don't want a watch that has a quartz crystal anywhere near it. I have no interest in that. To those people, I don't know. Yeah, that's this isn't the watch for you then. That's, you know, the, the long and short of it. Get a Rolex, get a get a Seamaster. I, I think there is a high beat Grand Seiko that aesthetically is a little bit different, but a, still a very nice watch. Maybe that's an option for you. Uh, but I love the Spring Drive because it's so accurate. It's a very set it and forget it as long as you keep the power reserve up every three days. Good to go. Speaking of power reserve, three day power reserve or seventy two hours to a two day or forty eight hour power reserve on the Rolex. That's another big difference. The Rolex has, at least on this particular version, this is the Submariner date, the date Cyclops. A lot of people hate that Cyclops. I love it. I can definitely say that I I I, I wouldn't want the Cyclops on the Seiko because it just would look a little weird on a Seiko. Uh, but I love having the Cyclops on the Submariner. It makes it much more legible and readable. Even at this zoomed in distance here, you can see how much better you can see that date. Now, again, some people are going to hate that, though. That's going to make watches like the Grand Seiko or maybe the Omega Seamaster more appealing to those people if they want a dive watch with a date. Um, the bezels, the, the, the Rolex bezel is just better, straight up. Uh, better edge texturing, although the edge texturing on the Grand Seiko is good. Better action overall, uh, manipulating or operating the bezel. It's just overall better on the Rolex. Not to say that the Grand Seiko is bad, but, you know, it, it is what it is. The bracelets, and in particular the clasps, the, the Rolex has the glide lock. And if you're not familiar with the glide lock, I mean, you probably should be. But fold open safety latch. We don't have dual triggers like on the Grand Seiko. It's a hinge. And then, of course, the glide lock just pops and you can slide, right? And, and it's always hidden. It looks very clean, tucked away. Uh, you know, it's, it, it is just a a better system, in my opinion, for a number of obvious reasons. That, again, not to say that the Grand Seiko system is necessarily bad, at least it has the option, uh, but not nearly as good. Now there is a $2,500 difference between these watches, so there should be some better things about the Rolex than the Grand Seiko, but the Grand Seiko, I mean, it punches above its weight class when we start comparing maybe the fit and finish, and while I did say that, yeah, the Zeratsu high polish doesn't necessarily look much better than a standard high polish on, you know, the flanks of, of the Submariner, for example, I just don't really see that much of an overall difference stylistically, the, the fit and the finish. It's, it's a little more dressed up. I think you're getting more in terms of the fit and finish with the Grand Seiko than you are with the, the Rolex, without a doubt, even though quality-wise they're both excellent for what they give you. The Rolex's brushing is excellent. The Rolex's polishing is excellent, but it doesn't have as many different uh, facets, bevels. Um, you know, it's it's much simpler. It's plainer. So you do get more for a cheaper price point with the Grand Seiko. Absolutely. They're both outstanding watches. Now, I do prefer the Submariner. It's my favorite watch, without a doubt. But I am surprised how much I do like this Grand Seiko. I think it's outstanding, and I'm very happy to have had the opportunity to check it out, to bring it to review here on YouTube. All right, guys, there we have it. The Grand Seiko Spring Drive Diver, reference number SBGA029, a watch that I actually, as it turns out, like a lot more than I was expecting. On paper, the specifications, or the dimensions, to be more specific, kind of scared me a little bit. A watch that's 44 millimeters in diameter with a wingspan or a lug-to-lug -lug length of over 
50 millimeters sounds like a pretty darn large watch. Something that might be appropriate for somebody with a seven and a half or an eight inch wrist, but somebody with my sized wrist under seven inches, it might come off feeling a little oversized. Now, as it turns out, and I can't really accurately express why, something to do with the style, the aesthetic, maybe the case shape, I don't know what it is, but it does actually wear really well on my wrist, and that's probably one of the big reasons why it impressed me a lot more than I was expecting. Nevertheless, I think that, like I said in the intro, there are three sort of reference standard luxury dive watches. If you're thinking about jumping into a luxury dive watch, at least at a price point under $10,000, it's really got to come down to the Rolex Submariner, the Omega Seamaster, and this Grand Seiko Spring Drive Diver. And you can't go wrong with any one of them. The Omega and this Grand Seiko turn out being, I think, a little bit better of a, a value proposition than the Rolex. The Rolex is quite a bit more expensive, but all three watches are outstanding options. And having had a chance to review all three now fairly extensively on my channel, I can say that you can't go wrong with either or any of them. Well, that's gonna wrap this one up for today. I hope you enjoyed the video. As always, I want to say thank you for joining me. I really do appreciate it. If you'd like to help support the channel, check out the description of this video or any video I do. There's a number of ways that you can help me out. Number one, join me on social media, be it Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Links are down below. I'd really like to get some more support over there. Number two, if you'd like to help me out financially, which I do greatly appreciate, I have links to my Patreon account. A big thanks to the guys that have been supporting me on Patreon since the beginning of my YouTube channel. Guys, I really do appreciate it very much. Finally, if you'd like to help support me financially, but you don't want to spend any extra money, there's a way that you can do that. You can shop on Amazon through my Amazon affiliate link, also found in the description. If you click on that Amazon affiliate link before you buy something, like let's say you want to buy a watch that I've reviewed, I'll get a small commission. You click on that link, you go find whatever you want to order. When you purchase it, again, a small commission does come my way. Those commissions do actually add up and help me out quite a bit. So a big thanks to everyone that has been using my Amazon Amazon affiliate link. I do appreciate it very much. Well, that's going to do it for today. So until the next one, I'll sign off and say bye now.